Good afternoon, and welcome to the Longmont Museum's Steward Auditorium. My name's Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the Steward Auditorium. So glad to have you here. Yeah. Welcome. Who's never been here before? Wow. We love new faces. What do you think so far? We're not always the most punctual space in town, but uh, one of the nicer, maybe. Anyway, we're really glad to have you here. Uh, the Longmont Museum does one whole heck of a lot of stuff. Uh, we have art shows. We have two galleries. Uh, we have a contemporary art show up right now featuring the work of Colorado-based contemporary artist Terry Maker. We also have a permanent exhibition up called Front Range Rising. Uh, it's kind of a history of the Front Range told through the lens of Longmont, Colorado, which is where you are right now, by the way. Longmont. That's right. Um, we are so glad to have our media sponsor in the house tonight, KGNU. We simply can't do all that we do without the support of KGNU, our members and sponsors, and donors. So thank you. If we have any members in the audience, thank you especially. Thank you. I see those hands. Thanks. Anyway, if you don't have one of these, please grab it on your way out the door. This is chock full of everything we do through the spring. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the man, the founder and publisher of the Colorado Springs Independent, or as he calls it, the Colorado Springs Codependent. He, was, uh, he worked for Nader for 10 years, and he's on the board of Jim Hightower's nonprofit. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Weiss to the Stewart Auditorium. Thank you. Um, I want, boy, all of a sudden it's dark in here. Um, I want to thank Justin in this beautiful space. I want to thank Joe Ritchie and David Barsamian from Alternative Radio. And I knew Joe when he worked at the Maine Poets. And, no, he didn't work at it. He, that was his life, the, li the Maine Poets and Writers Association. We lived in Portland, Maine together for a long time. And I called Joe and said, Hightower's coming to Colorado Springs, and then he's going to keynote uh, our revolution event in Denver. Do you want to bring anybody here? And he said, we got to bring two people in. One was... Uh, KGNU and the other one was Boulder Weekly and the publisher of Boulder Weekly Fran Zankowski is right here I'd have him stand but it's in the dark so you can't see it so um, we also want to thank hey thank you we also want to thank Avery Brewing Company uh, for their generous donation and the Boulder Arts uh, Commission an agency of the Boulder City Council for helping sponsor this event I first met Jim Hightower via his writing. I was a freshman at Colorado College, and I was reading a class, and I was reading, doing a book on economics of agriculture. And you know what? You used to go in the library and you used to look at the books, and you just, I came across this book saying, Hard Times, Hard Tomatoes. And I had never, all the other books were like boring titles, so I just picked it off the shelf. And it was an expose on how the uh, agribusiness lobby, which was, went and they wanted to, to make foods that could ship long distance that look good. They didn't care how they tasted. They didn't care the nutritional value. So they spent literally tens of thousands of dollars on campaign contributions. Things were cheap back in the days. 
and they got hundreds of millions of dollars of federal government research to Cornell, probably to Fort Collins, to all the ag industry to start making hard tomatoes, hard times that you could ship across the country. And Jim's book outlined exactly how the money went from the agribusiness to the lobbyists to the senators and the House members on the Ag Committee to then fund these projects. And so taxpayer money, instead of supporting local organic farms, supported big business and trying to make hard tomatoes that could be shipped across the country. The next <clears throat> time I met Jim is when I was an organizer for Fred Harris for president. He was an Oklahoma senator. He was, lack of anything else, the Bernie Sanders of his day. And Jim was the campaign manager for that presidential bid. And after that presidential bid in 1976, Fred Harris became a University of New Mexico uh, political science professor. So Jim helped him do that, uh, do that transition. Then I met Jim again in Boulder at an event organized by KGNU. And I was so, I, he's always been one of my heroes. In 19, and I had just launched The Independent and we had carried his column since the beginning, just like the Boulder Weekly has, in 1995. And I asked him to come to Colorado Springs. And so we brought him to Colorado Springs and he was a breath of fresh air. And he, he came again last, he spoke yesterday. We had 750 people, okay? And I don't want to make Jim's head too big, but it was also to see the Molly Ivins movie and Jim and Molly go way back. So it was a twofer. So Jim, most of you know Jim, so I'm not going to do much more of an introduction to say he and Ann Richards were the last two state Democrats elected statewide in, uh, in Texas. And Jim served two terms as Texas Agricultural Commission, and he, um, he got defeated by a guy named Carl Rove who ran dirty tricks on him. And guess who defeated him? Rick Perry. So with no further ado, because you all know Jim, I'm going to turn it over to him. Jim Hightower. Hi, Jim. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very nice. What a joy. Thanks so much. Great to be here in uh, sunny Longmont and uh, right here at the uh, Museum uh, of uh, History uh, in this uh, agricultural area, which it formerly was uh, and uh, still has a lot of that going here. So it just makes me, uh, well, I, I, I thank uh, the group for allowing uh, Scruffy Texas Populist to come in here and uh, be a part of uh, uh, this KGNU Boulder Weekly Political Palooza. Uh, that we're having here, uh, Palooza for independent media, for common sense in an era of senseless uh, activity, and for free beer. I mean, who else <laughs> would bring you free beer? Uh, I, as John indicated, uh, almost from the start of my uh, radio commentaries, uh, began back in 1993, uh, KGNU. Uh, has been right there, uh, and it's been a joy for me to be a part of their uh, community, which is really what it is. Uh, you know, community radio puts the unity in community, and they have all kinds of gatherings, uh, not just in Boulder, but obviously here in Longmont and all around, and then many stations that now airs uh, their programs. Uh, they are what I call radioactive uh, radio, <laughs> and they do a tremendous, tremendous job. Uh, I think of uh, KGNU in terms of a, a motel uh, that's a, a, a kind of an iconic motel from back in the uh, 1930s uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, right near where I live, uh, called the Austin Motel. Uh, but it had a, had a, a marquee sign that said, uh, uh, no additives, no preservatives, corporate free since 1938. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and that is... 
KG and U doesn't qu quite go back to 1938, but it certainly is corporate free because uh, uh, it doesn't need preservatives because uh, you are its preservatives. The, the listeners to the radio station are the preservatives, uh, and it doesn't need any additives because it knows what it stands for. It knows what it's trying to do, and the democracy mission that it has is so fulfilled. And then Boulder Weekly, as John indicated, also carried uh, my uh, little electric uh, column uh, from the start, uh, and these these weeklies, including John's and the, the Boulder Weekly, uh, are so essential uh, in our country today. Uh, and they're actually uh, doing the real journalism in America uh, these days because, of course, the hedge funds and uh, uh, the, the the billionaires have taken over uh, the media. My newspaper, the Austin American Statesman, uh, in the Daily in my hometown. Uh, is now a product of Gannett. Uh, but you've got to go, really you've got to follow the bouncing ball on this. Uh, the American Statesman was owned by the Cox chain out of Atlanta. It sold it uh, a few years ago, to, to a couple of years ago, to Gatehouse, uh, which is a hedge fund uh, operation off of Wall Street, except Gatehouse doesn't really exist. Gatehouse is owned by something called the New Media Investment Group, uh, which is financed and managed by something called the Fortress Investment Group, which is owned by a fracking baron, a uh, billionaire, uh, and New Media uh, was bought uh, by SoftBank Group uh, last year, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, huge uh, bank operation uh, over there, which also owns Sprint uh, and is trying to to, to buy a T, uh, T what you call it, uh, yeah, T-Mobile. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, the, new, the New Media Fortress SoftBank Group was bought uh, late last year by Gannett, uh, which was financed by the Apollo Global Management Group, <laughs> which financed it with a 11.5% interest loan. Uh, that 11.5% is really important because it means uh, that, uh, that they're taking all the profit out of the top to pay for the financing, and that means that they're firing uh, the reporters uh, and, and shrinking the paper down uh, to nothing, and that is ex exactly what is happening. You know, Lily Tomlin once said, no matter how cynical you get, it's almost impossible to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> so... So the antidote to uh, cynicism is, uh, is you. Uh, coming out into the countryside, I'm a lucky duck. I do a lot of traveling and I've been about just about every place that's got a zip code, uh, visiting with people like you who are doing things. Uh, people, groups of people, uh, coalitions of groups of people uh, you don't, that you don't hear about in the national media or from the politicians. Uh, but you are the source of the democratic hope uh, in our country. Uh, so it just makes me happier than a chigger at a nudist colony to be <laughs> standing up here looking out at all of you right-wing butt-kickers and corporate greed-whackers, <laughs> you, you grassroots agitators, uh, and indeed you are agitators, uh, and the powers that be try to make that a pejorative, don't they? All those agitators. Our, our, our workers were perfectly happy in this factory until those union agitators came in. and uh, no, The poor people didn't mind living up against that toxic waste dump until those environmental agitators came in. Well, horse hockey, uh, agitation uh, is what built America. Uh, were it not for agitators. Yeah. And I don't mean just the, the founding fathers. Uh, uh, as useful as they were, but the real agitators were Thomas Paine and Daniel Shays. They were the abolitionists and the suffragists, uh, Frederick Douglass and uh, uh, the, uh, populists and unionists, uh, the Bonus Brigade and the uh, conscientious objectors, Mother Jones and Woody Guthrie, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez, Karen Silkwood and Harvey Milk, and now down to you and me to be the agitators again. And that is a good thing. As Jesse Jackson used to put it, the agitator is the center post in the washing machine that gets the dirt out. So, <laughs> so I come to you tonight uh, not just uh, 
from Austin, uh, Texas, uh, but from South Austin. Uh, and uh, things are a little different uh, over there. We have a little more irreverent attitude. Molly Ivins lived over there in my neighborhood. John Henry Falk uh, was out of there, and so many other mavericks and malcontents and mutts. Uh, and, uh, uh, and our unofficial slogan on the South Side is, we're all here because we're not all there. <laughs> Well, I think we're all here uh, because the powers that be are not at all there uh, in terms of understanding what America is all about, understanding uh, that the essential glue of our society is the notion that we're all in this together. Uh, my old daddy, you got to be aware of Texans telling daddy stories, but I had a, had a pretty good one, and, and, uh, and he... he he didn't know he had a political philosophy, but he did. Uh, and he expressed it to me periodically in these terms. He said, Jim, everybody does better when everybody does better. <laughs> and that's what's missing <laughs> in our society today. So here we are in a big time uh, for America, a big time uh, for democracy and for you and me and, and our progeny. Uh, a, a, an historic time, another of those when in the course of human events moments that Thomas Jefferson wrote about. Uh, you, you see it in, in inequality that is rending our nation. You see it in the rise of autocracy and plutocracy. You see it in the health care crisis. You see it in the climate change crisis, etc. Uh, they're exterminating the whole idea of the common good. Uh, there's a and, and that means that we have to step forward bolder than we ever have before. Uh, and that's, uh, there's a dicho in South Texas, uh, a grandis malis uh, remedios grandis, uh, for great maladies need great remedies. And it's not enough for us progressives uh, to just point to Trump and say, uh, and his government of... Uh, <laughs> Goofy, uh, sleepy, sleazy, creepy, Larry, Curly, and Moe. Uh, it's not enough, to point to, not enough for us to point to them and say, well, we're not them. Uh, people rightly want to know, well, who are you? Uh, and they're looking for a little d populist answer to that. Here's the core reality that, that we face in our country. Uh, folks know that the real powers are not the politicians, uh, but the Wall Street elites and the corporate chieftains who've been funding and controlling the elections and the agendas of both parties. Uh, you don't have to be in who's who to know what's what, do you? I mean, uh, corporate power is why the economic and political systems in our country are rigged, rigged to knock down the middle class, to hold down the poor, and to tear down our democratic rights. Economists actually have a technical term for what powers that be are doing to us. It's called stealing. <laughs> uh, faster than a hog eats supper, they're stealing uh, from us. Uh, stealing our, our, our very little d democratic uh, possibilities. Uh, I think of that song that uh, Woody Guthrie had about pretty boy Floyd the outlaw. Uh, had a verse in it that says, through this world I travel, I see lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. It's the fountain pens who are doing the serious stealing in our society today. Uh, we see it uh, throughout uh, our culture. Uh, Walmart, uh, the typical Walmart employee makes $22,000 a year. The five Walmart heirs, the Walton family, uh, make $25,000 a minute. Uh, that is inequality by its very definition. Uh, the three richest people in America now hold more wealth than the bottom half of the American people. Three people have more wealth than 165 million people have. That is inequality. Uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, some of these guys are getting so rich they could afford to air condition hell. And I, <laughs> and I tell you what, they'd better be setting some money aside for that project, I think. <laughs> I, and, and I love it when they, you know, when, when they come out, uh, the, these uh, billionaires. and now there's a new term, centibillionaires. That's people who have more than 100 
billion dollars. Uh, Jeff Bezos is one of those of Amazon, et cetera. Anyway, they, uh, they come out and say, well, uh, of course, we, we give to charity because that's our way of giving back. Well, if you're giving back, that means you took too much to start with. <laughs> so let us not be swayed by that. And in fact, uh, you know, they say, well, yes, we, we do make a lot of money. We, we haul in a ton of money, but we are philanthropists. Uh, and Mark Zuckerberg uh, even uh, complained about Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax because he said, that's going to impinge on my philanthropy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a quick story of what the gods uh, think about charity. It comes from uh, Earl Long, Huey Long's brother, when Earl was governor of Louisiana back in uh, the 1950s. And he told about a rich man who died and tried to get into heaven. But if you'd gone to that little... Methodist church that I did growing up in Denison, Texas, you'd know that you just don't march into heaven. You've, you've got to appear at the pearly gates. And there's an angel outside going to look over your life. And then St. Peter back here is going to render judgment about whether you get to come in or not. So here comes this rich man. And the angel looks over his life and says, Oh my God, you never did no good no, for nobody. No way. What, what are you doing here? And rich men say, well, now, that's not entirely true. There was that time in 1924 when a beggar man was on the street and I put a nickel in his cup. And the angel said, so? And the rich man said, well, uh, then in 1934, a widow woman needing car fare home and I gave her a nickel. And the angel said, that doesn't make up for a life of greed. And the rich man said, well, now, hold it, because I've got a consistent pattern of philanthropy in 1944. I was coming out of my bank at Christmas time, Salvation Army kettle, and I put a nickel in there. And the angel turns back to St. Peter and says, what in the world are we going to do with this man? And St. Peter said, give him back his 15 cents and tell him to go to hell. Because <laughs> it's not charity we want. We want America's founding populist values, economic fairness, social justice, equal opportunity for all people. That's what we stand for. That's what America represents right there. Yet we're in a battle, inequality throughout our economy. And inequality is just another way of saying injustice. Uh, take the food economy, as I referred to at the top. Uh, we're in an agricultural area here. Our food economy is a wreck. Uh, the people who produce the food uh, get not only the least, but uh, practically nothing. You buy a $29 bucket of fried chicken, the farmer gets 58 cents. $29, 58 cents. All the money goes to the Tysons and the uh, Pilgrim Pride and the, uh, the, the giant uh, uh, processors uh, of it and marketers of it. Uh, milk economy, dairy farmers are just being wiped out right and left across this country, including in this state. Uh, and it's because uh, we've got monopolies controlling it. 60% uh, of the raw milk produced in America is controlled uh, by uh, two corporations. Uh, but, but you don't market milk nationally. You market it regionally. And one of those corporations, Dean Foods, which is based here in Denver, I believe, but here in Colorado, Dean Foods uh, controls 90% of the milk market in Wisconsin, in Michigan, and in Vermont, and about 70% in many other states as well. It is a monopoly. Uh, the farmer doesn't stand a chance in that. So the price is being knocked down uh, for the farmer and raised for the consumer. Uh, and that's because of policy. Uh, we, we have an agricultural policy uh, that has gone from butts to nuts. Uh, I, you know, again, these are deliberate decisions uh, made by our policyholders. Earl Butts, you might remember him, Uncle Earl. He was a Secretary of Agriculture under Richard Nixon. And Earl stepped forward and said, this trend toward less farms is not bad. It's good that we have been able to produce an increasing amount of food with the work of a smaller percentage of our population. This releases people to do something useful in their lives. <laughs> uh, Ezra Taft Benson, Eisenhower's Secretary of Agriculture, uh, said farmers need the spur of insecurity. Ronald Reagan said uh, farm foreclosures and bankruptcies are part of the necessary solution 
My program hasn't hurt anybody. No one's been thrown out in the snow to die. That's a high standard, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Carter, many of you will not make it, but it will be better for those of you who survive. And uh, now, you know, here we are with Donnie Trump and gang, and you know, their idea of a good farm program is hee-haw. Uh, we, we've got a guy who's Secretary of Agriculture now. His name is Sonny Perdue. He's out of Georgia. Uh, a peanut producing state, by the way, and Sonny is the biggest goober of them all. Uh, he, he's, he enjoys uh, mocking uh, his constituency. What do you call two farmers in a basement? He asked in an ag industry ga uh, gathering. A wine cellar, he guffawed. Uh, uh, in America, uh, he icily told hard hit dairy farmers up in Wisconsin the big get bigger and the small gut get out. Again, the Secretary of Agriculture. And then, of course, he goes even uh, further, uh, attacking poor people for receiving food stamps. He says, government dependency has never been the American dream. This from a guy who has been dependent on a government check for two decades of his life. Uh, on, on and on. I mean, the thing is, ag policy today, farm policy, food policy, is being written uh, by lawyers and lobbyists uh, and economists, uh, people who could not run a watermelon stand if we gave them the melons and had the highway patrol flag down the customers for them. <laughs> but they're in charge of writing the policy, which is why it is perverse. Uh, of course, you're right here in a fracking zone, uh, and we deal with that uh, in Texas uh, as well. Uh, indeed, here's a, a lovely... Uh, color-coded map, which you can't see, so I'll show it to you anyway, uh, which has just the blotches of fracking uh, all across uh, our country, including great swaths of Colorado, particularly northeastern uh, Colorado, where uh, we are. Uh, and the, the big oil frackers are uh, just a classic example of the power and arrogance of that industry. Uh, using uh, preemption, which I think they did here, did they not? Uh, to, to have the state preempt your right as a local people to decide that you would like to ban fracking uh, here. We have experienced that in Texas uh, as well. Uh, so they extract and they exploit, and then they dodge their taxes, which you've also been fighting uh, here in uh, Colorado. Uh, and then they create these environmental and health problems uh, Frackastrophes, they're called, <laughs> uh, and you know, completely uh, uh, using just gabillions of uh, uh, tons of water uh, and of sand, both of which happen uh, to be uh, precious uh, resources. Uh, you know about water generally. Down in southwest Texas, the water table dropped from 20 feet to two feet within two years of fracking uh, beginning down there. So farmers in that area are wiped out. Cities are wiped out. They're not cities, but they're small towns that are wiped out with good water. Sand, most people don't realize, I didn't realize until I dug into it and we wrote about it in the, the lowdown, that sand, sand uh, is a, we're just massively consuming sand, which is a, a perishable commodity. Uh, uh, every, every concrete, well, this building, uh, the streets, uh, the high rises in Denver, uh, the glass, every piece of glass is made of sand. Uh, and we've consumed so much of it already that it's now a, a rare commodity, so they're dredging oceans to be able to bring sand in. And some sand, like in Dubai, where they had the huge high-rise uh, buildings, tallest in the world over there, their sand is too soft to use to make cement uh, and to make glass. So they import sand from North Carolina to Dubai. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's insanity. Uh, and then uh, they're now on a pitch, ALEC, the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council front group uh, for uh, corporations to put legislation into state legislatures and do the corporate will. Uh, they are passing something called critical infrastructure bills, which criminalizes uh, protests of uh, critical infrastructure, which are pipelines uh, and uh, fracking sites, uh, 
and uh, oil refineries uh, and even uh, hog farms uh, and chicken farms are part of the critical infrastructure of America that if you protest it in certain ways, it means you're going to do two years uh, in jail. So it is c the complete uh, perversion of our democratic uh, ideals. So the question becomes, who's going to stand up to these forces of greed and stand up for the Gougies? Uh, the, the powers that be uh, have to be confronted by the powers that ought to be. The workers, the environmentalists, the farmers, the consumers, veterans, everyday people. But yet that question of who's going to stand up is the big question in this year's Democratic primaries. Because whoever wins the Democratic primary is going to be our channel to deal with Donald Trump and to begin to reverse some of this stuff. If we have somebody who is nominated for the, by the Democrats to stand up uh, for the Gougies. The Democratic establishment, unfortunately, uh, is still controlled by what I call pusillanimous Democrats. It's a clean word. You can look it up. <laughs> I mean, some of these Democrats are weaker than Canadian hot sauce, you know, when it comes to... <laughs> When it comes to standing up for the people they're supposed to stand up for, and when it comes to standing up for the democratic principles. I mean, thank God they weren't in charge when Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt passed things like Social Security and, uh, and the wage and hour laws uh, and right on down the line. They would have said, oh, no, that's too strong. We can't do that. The people will be opposed to it. The people will be scared of it. Indeed, Medicare for all. Um, a, the governor of, uh, I think it was Delaware, uh, rose up and said, well, uh, we, we can't say Medicare for all because that scares people. I mean, excuse me, I say Medicare for all a lot, <laughs> and it does not scare anybody. They rise up and cheer when you say <laughs> Medicare for all because you're talking about delivering the basic of health care to every man, woman, and child in America as a matter of human right. Uh, people are in favor of that. One of our Democratic uh, contenders said that a majority of Democrats oppose Medicare for All. Hello. The latest poll in December showed 81% of Democrats in favor of Medicare for All. Uh, Two-thirds of independents. Uh, apple pie doesn't get 81%. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, wealth tax. Oh, well, that's too strong. That scares people. Uh, well, 77% of Democrats favor it, 55% of independents, and 57% of Republicans favor Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax. So we don't have to fear the people. There was a poll done in December, another poll by the Center for uh, American Progress, which is uh, a, a, essentially a Democratic uh, uh, establishment uh, front group. Uh, they, they do a lot of good work, though. And they did a survey, uh, and they found that 70% or more of the people, including a majority of Republicans, agree that college education is too expensive and states ought to help people afford a college education without getting buried in debt. They said that rich families and corporations should pay more in taxes. They said that pharmaceutical companies should be penalized if drug prices rise faster than inflation. They say government should increase good jobs with a trillion dollar investment in infrastructure, including production of green energy. They say we should reduce inequality with a 2% wealth tax. And get this, eight out of 10 Democrats, three fourths of independents and 49% of Republicans say corporations have too much power and should be strongly regulated. So we don't have to fear the people. Uh, the people are way ahead of the politicians and way ahead of the media, by the way, as, as well. So my message to you, and I'm sure you're wondering what it is by now, uh, <laughs> is that it's up to us. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not up to Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. It's not up to uh, the Democratic Party. It's not up to the Congress, uh, any governor, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's up to you and me, uh, we the people, joining together can make the big difference. We the people have got to take the stand. We've got to be the ones that push back against 
the gougees, uh, the gougers out there who are ripping uh, us off. And so, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people say, "Oh, well, I'm just a, I'm just a little person." You know, I. I can't make a difference against this. But just remember this. Even the smallest dog can lift its leg on the tallest building. <laughs> America can be as big as we want it to be, as big as we need it to be. We certainly have the wealth, and as these polls indicate, uh, we have uh, the grassroots support. Uh, we have all that we need to stand up in the bold spirit of Franklin and also of Eleanor Roosevelt to do as, as Franklin Roosevelt said in his campaign in 1936, to restore America to its own people. Uh, that's the fight that we're in. It's just that straightforward. That's the importance of, uh, of KGNU. That's the importance of the Boulder Weekly. That's the importance of an independent media, but that's also the importance of groups or of people organized into groups that are making political fights. And I can tell you that all across America, we're winning those political fights. It's, it's an astonishing story that goes untold by the establishment media, but there it is. Because we've got to form uh, together. Uh, there's a, a little hardware store not too far from where I live in Austin, uh, called Harold's Hardware, independent place, not one of these big box stores. It's uh, no bigger than this hall right here. Uh, but it's a great place. Uh, you, you don't have to buy the whole carton of nails. They'll sell you two nails if that's what you're looking for. you know. And, uh, and they'll say, well, what are, you, what are you trying to do? Well, I want to build a, a lectern. OK, well, let's pencil it out and see what you need. They'll loan you a tool. You can take a power saw home and bring it back. And the slogan at Harold's Hardware is, together, we can do it yourself. <laughs> now, that's got to be our slogan, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> because we can't do it ourselves, but together we can, all of ourselves coming uh, together. So we've got to keep reaching out uh, to those farmers, for example, uh, to musicians. They don't have health care. Uh, to restaurant owners, small business owners. Uh, they don't have health care. They're getting screwed by the tax laws, uh, et cetera. Uh, they're natural allies. To evangelicals, by the way, um, most of which are poor people, are relatively poor people, and, and are inclined uh, to, to our view on economic issues. So we've got to reach out to these uh, people. As Jesse Jackson put it, uh, we might not all have come over on the same boat, but we're in the same boat now. <laughs> And that's a powerful political reality. Uh, if we exercise it, we work on it. And then you've got to persevere. Again, you don't win the first time out. I lost my first race uh, for statewide office in Texas and came back two years later and won uh, and, and was able to do quite, quite a bit of good stuff because people came together uh, and they formed a, a, a movement. Uh, that elected me and Ann Richards and uh, Jimmy Maddox as Attorney General, Gary Morrow as Land Commissioner. We were all young. Each had kind of differing constituencies, but we campaigned together, worked together. All of us got elected. That meant we could govern together. We could trust each other and rely on each other. You formed a movement that could actually uh, govern. Uh, so you got to persevere, uh, stick, at, stick with it. Um, and again, you don't get there that first time. Willie Nelson told me that uh, I tell you, the, the uh, early bird might get the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> might want to pencil that out for some of the slower ones <laughs> here tonight. Uh, and mainly, uh, we've got to stay strong, uh, recognize the strength that we have and recognize uh, the, the, the justice uh, for which uh, we are fighting uh, and be bold about it. Uh, Thomas Paine said, let them call me rebel and welcome. I feel no concern from it, nor should we. Let them call us radicals. Let them call us agitators. Let them call us uh, crazy people. <laughs> let them call us whatever they want. But we are actually the majority. <laughs> And we have uh, the potential to put America, to restore America to its own uh, people again. 
and just keep agitating, agitating, agitating. I'll leave you with this thought, uh, and, and we'll get to some questions if you have them, comments. Uh, and it's from uh, Louis, Louis Grizzard, the late great Southern humorist, uh, who said something that we in the South have always known to be true, and that is that there's a big difference between being naked and being naked. Uh, naked means you have no clothes on. Naked means you have no clothes on and you are up to something. <laughs> so let's get naked together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike, Mike, working? Yeah. working? I have two asks tonight. I came to Colorado in 1972 to look at Colorado College, and I went down to Acacia Park, and there was an anti-war protest. Anyone have an idea who was leading the protest? 1972. Fort Carson soldiers. There was a draft. The coolest coffee shops, everyone, this, it was a whole different world back then, but the, the Air Force Academy had a 40% dropout rate. It's a whole different world, okay? I'm telling you this because Colorado Springs, John Kerry was there when he was head of Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and he made his comment, which he's famous for, saying, who wants to be the last soldier to die for this misguided, whatever, he went on more eloquently than me. But it was so powerful, and he was talking to soldiers. So one of the asks I have is Colorado Springs is changing. We are the fastest growing city in Colorado, in Colorado right now because we have cheap land, we have lots of water, and we have very little regulation, okay? So it's a lot cheaper to expand down in Colorado Springs than other places. There's a huge movement afoot there. Right now, there's a majority of moderates and progressives who have taken over the city council. We have, okay? I know it doesn't sound great, but of our 16 elected representatives to the legislature, three are Democrats. And Pete Lee is doing an amazing job of head of the Judiciary Committee with the Restorative Justice. I'm saying this because you need to start thinking differently about Colorado Springs, and we need the support of the rest of the city. And so, but I do want to just go back in the day. I was wearing a T-shirt when, after I went to the first rally, the anti-war rally in Acacia Park, I went to Hibbert's department store. And I said, uh, I was just waiting while I had gone to the bathroom and a woman I was with, a girl I was with, was using the bathroom and somebody came up and asked me where they could get flatware. And I didn't even know what flatware was. <laughs> and then somebody else asked me where they could buy a toaster and I said I didn't know. Well, I was wearing a t-shirt and it said that these words on it. <laughs> They thought I was a question authority, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, I knew the answers. So my first ask is you believe in Colorado Springs and don't write us off and work with us. We need infusions. We had the largest gain of any city in the country of people between 21 and 34 last year. That's because they can't afford Denver. So they're coming to Colorado Springs and they're changing our, are changing our community. So that's the first ask. The second ask is, Jim is the best investigative reporter now that Molly Ivins has died. No, but he's really, really good. He's, sorry. His newsletter is on a range of topics. 
They're incredible. It's a one-man machine, okay? He, we need subscriptions to his newsletter. He's not charging for this event. We would like, we would like for you to invest $15, get that newsletter once a month, it will make you laugh, it will make you angry. There's always a take action what you can do because Jim is positive and we need subscribers. Right now we have about 100,000 subscribers, it's pretty good. But we, we need more and this is not something I should say, but some of us, every year we lose some subscribers because they pass on, okay? <laughs> Literally, our, it's a, he's got an older readership. But we need new subscribers. I gave, a, we had 500 subscriptions card. We have uh, 18 left. If you would like us, you can go online and order it there. It's just 15 bucks. Or if you want to save your stamp, you can come and see me. But please subscribe. We really need it and you need the information. With no further ado, Mr. Hightower for questions. Papers. Thank you, John. An unpaid commercial <laughs> message. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, questions, uh, comments, observations, keen insights, humor? Uh, about a dozen years ago, we had a half a conversation with um, somebody. Um, keep, it, keep it brief, please. We had about a half a conversation a dozen years ago. Somebody cut us off. A friend of mine who is a Texas journalist, Dick Revis, yeah. I don't know, he wrote this book, If White Kids Die, about him and me in Alabama 55 years ago. And uh, really, uh, I mean, what really goes on in the world, I got master's in philosophy and history, and other, I've never been able to get a job because of my role in the movement and being a historian. I'm trying. Let me say it. Please. Please. Ahead, I just it. gave a Black History Month talk today at Second Baptist in Boulder. But just the point is, history is crucial. Could you speak about the, They're abolishing it in the school system, colleges, high school, everything. Could you speak about the importance of real history? Right. Thank you. Yes. No, that's a very good point. <laughs> yes, we, we either don't teach our history or we trivialize the history uh, by doing the great man uh, notion of where America came from, from for example, uh, rather than it came from grassroots people just like us, and that's the only thing that has ever changed uh, the country. Uh, was uh, it's, it's never come from the top down. It's always boiled up from the from the grassroots. So we, that so one we had to push, as you're suggesting, uh, in in the school systems, uh, both the uh, local school systems and state and national, uh, that uh, that we do a a, a real history uh, job uh, for our people. Uh, but then uh, we can't wait on them because uh, it's going to be a long time. Uh, so we've got to do it ourselves. Uh, we, we have to be the teachers. And you suggested today you went to a Baptist church in Denver and you taught some history. Uh, we can all be teachers. You, you don't have to have a degree to be a teacher. Uh, in fact, some of the best teachers are just those who have personal experiences and share them. And I would urge you also, as uh, particularly those of you who have organizations, uh, to do a lot of oral history uh, within your own group. There are so many people who have been a part of this movement, this little d democratic movement, uh, for decades. Uh, and we need to take their stories down, make them as, as touching as they possibly can, and then get them out uh, to young people. And luckily, we have something called the internet now uh, that uh, bypasses a lot of the established uh, blockages uh, in the system. So just go at it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, my question is that uh, I would like to go down to the corner and have a poster to uh, uh, stir up some rabble resin. Uh, what kind of slogan should I put on that that might influence the, uh, <laughs> the undecided voters, you know, yeah. that uh, make a difference, not just well, to stir up matter? He's asking that he'd like to go down on the corner with a poster uh, and make a political statement of some sort. What, what, 
would be an appropriate slogan to, to put on that poster. Uh, I think question authority would be a good one. <laughs> and you can get it off of John's T-shirt uh, here. Uh, but uh, but th that's, that's the core. You know, question authority and then question authority's answers. Uh, that's, that's what it is to be a democracy. Uh, oh, here, here we go. We've got right here. Um, I've got a unique experience being a lifelong Democrat up until the election of uh, 2016. I went to all the, uh, I went to four rallies. And actually, uh, I was a Bernie guy. And after I saw what the DNC did to Bernie and what they're doing now to my choice would be Tulsi Gabbard, and Michael Bennett was a good choice too, but I see that the DNC has been hijacked. I'm what you call a walk away. And there's a unique experience that I bring to this because I don't know how many people voted for a orange man bad or whatever you call it, but it's a bizarre experience to pick up any printed material, to, to go to the, any of the mainstream media, watch all of your keyboard journalists being censored from YouTube, being demonetized. The latest example of a more discussed with what used to be my party was watching these politicians sit on their hands and watching this Speaker of the House embarrass the entire country by tearing up a speech. All I, when I get into critical conversations, I'm sorry, my question is, you talk about fracking, Obama was the ones that put us on the map and Trump's getting credit for it. Obama had a policy, the question is, how can you, as of, of the left or the Democrats, rationalize what happened for eight years and now blame it on Trump? Well, the, the Democratic Party uh, establishment uh, uh, is, is a corporate establishment. Uh, it doesn't want Bernie Sanders. It doesn't really want Joe Biden. It doesn't want uh, uh, Kobachar. It doesn't want uh, Gabbard. It doesn't want uh, any Democrat uh, there. They want the weakest that, that, uh, that they can choose uh, for us. Uh, and so that's why, in addition, uh, when, when Bernie said, run, go run for office, he didn't just mean for state legislature and Congress and et cetera. Uh, he meant uh, for be a Democratic precinct chair, but be a, a Democratic county party chair, take over the Democratic Party and make it what it is supposed to be. Uh, that's our job to do. Uh, I can pretty well guarantee you that if you took 10 of your friends to the precinct elections coming up uh, within the Democratic Party, you would be the precinct chair. <laughs> Uh, it, it, does, it doesn't take that much of an organizing effort to, to make that happen and then begin to change those policies. Uh, we have to do that. We are doing that in Texas. Uh, there's a, a, the Our Revolution Group in Texas, which uh, I was a founder of. Uh, uh, we, we target those places, and we are winning county uh, chairmanships and, uh, all across the, the state. Uh, and, as well as winning uh, uh, elected offices uh, uh, for, uh, for public offices uh, as, as well. So it's a matter of just being in the game. And yeah, you can be dissuaded uh, because they, they're not responding to you, uh, but uh, just being angry about it isn't going to get it done. Uh, organize, do something. Good. So, hello. I'm very concerned about the fractious nature that we have in the Democratic Party or the progressives area. So I'm wondering how you think we can all come together and get this guy out of office, because that's really the most important part to me. And so I'm just looking for some answers from you. <laughs> yes, well, that is the first task, of course. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we're in a democratic process and it's messy. Uh, and we do not have a democratic cohesion on a candidate, or not even really two candidates. Uh, but we have very strong uh, philosophical, but more importantly, issue-based, principle-based uh, directions uh, to proceed. Uh, that's why we have elections. Uh, and so it's going to work out. Uh, you know, the, the media, for example, uh, keeps saying, well, um, Bernie uh, or Elizabeth Warren, uh, they, they, they can't uh, win. And, and Bernie, oh my God, Bernie's getting all these votes, but still he's only getting 25 to 28% of the vote. Uh, but if you add Elizabeth Warren's vote 
to that, uh, the, the progressive wing of the party, then you're getting 40, 45 percent of the vote. So you're getting up there. And they say, well, having Bernie would, would hurt the general election chances. Well, having a moderate or a corporatist in particular would hurt the Democratic chances in the general election even worse because people would not go vote. Uh, so we'd, we've got to not be afraid of our principles and not be afraid to stand up for what we believe in. Uh, and it'll settle out. Uh, we might not win this time, as I say, but we're building something bigger. We built something bigger in 2016, uh, and, and here we are now, even bigger. And in 2018, we built even more, particularly in the Congress, and then uh, this year, uh, and then on down the road. It's a long-term movement uh, that we're building. So don't fear it, uh, just uh, uh, engage in it. I look around this room and I see mostly gray hairs. I'm one too, but I've been best friends with Miss Claire, Claire all for 30 years, so I don't look it. But that concerns me, yeah, me too. that we don't have teenagers in here, we don't have college kids in here, we don't have parents of young children in here. How do we get this message to them, including the most apathetic Americans out there who are not enraged by anything that you're saying today because they have their Walmarts and they've got their cell phone. How do you reach them? How do we reach them? Well, the most apathetic are not worth reaching. Uh, so so let, let's, deal, let's deal with the real, with the real possibilities uh, here of what we can get. Uh, and, and you go to people who are persuadable, who do have interests, and I suggest that they have more concern than you're giving them credit for. Uh, and young people are getting this message. They're not getting it in meetings, but they're getting it uh, in podcasts. They're getting it uh, on the web. They're getting it in, in, in various electronic forums uh, and, and their own meeting places. So you can't keep saying to... Uh, uh, African Americans, uh, uh, Latinos, people of color, young people, uh, why don't you come to our meeting uh, rather than going to their meetings? Uh, if, if you want, we should be going to them and saying, how can we help you? Uh, not, not we want you to join us, but we'd like to join you. What issues are a concern for you? Uh, there's a, was a woman, uh, organizer uh, in Texas, Democratic organizer. She went out to a, a su suburb area with a meeting of the uh, uh, Democratic Women's uh, Association. Uh, and uh, the president of the association said to her, well, we can't get these Mexican-Americans to come to our meetings. And, uh, and the organizer said, you're meeting in the country club. <laughs> so, so we need to use a little common sense. There is a rally in Longmont every week on Saturday. It starts at 1 o'clock. People just show up because they want to. There were 23 of us there last Saturday. There's a counter rally across the street. There was 21 of those. We want to outnumber them. Come and join us and help us show them who's who. Thank you. Thank you. Six in Maine. Every Saturday, 1 o'clock. Good job. Uh, Jim, uh, thank you for being here. Um, Ten miles north of us is um, Weld County, and we have over 25,000 fracking wells up there. And it poses an existential threat to our public health. Yeah. We got a governor, and we got a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate, and they're not doing a damn thing to help us. What do you suggest? Uh, embarrass them. Uh, uh, you, you have to get in the face of power, and particularly that when, when the power is ostensibly on your side. Uh, they, they are embarrassable. Republicans mostly are not embarrassable. Uh, but, uh, but those Democrats are. Uh, and to be confronted uh, on the grounds that they are standing uh, for uh, corporate powers, money powers, that uh, most likely funnel some money into those campaigns. Uh, and that, uh, that the people expect more, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, if, uh, if they don't do it, 
uh, and a good number of them won't, then run against the son of a bitches. Uh, do a primary campaign. We have time for two more questions. Who has a question? And we're happy also to go drink beer. Uh, that's the last question right there. Thank hey, Jim. You. Oh. Joe Ritchie from Alternative Radio with a quick one. Hey, Jim, why is American football like U.S. foreign policy? <laughs> <laughs> well, they both consist of organized violence interrupted only by secret meetings. Uh, okay. What can we do about Pentagon spending in the next decade? Well, you have a chance right here because you're about to become the space force of America. <laughs> this is beyond ridiculous uh, uh, and almost beyond ridicule, uh, but it is being ridiculed. Uh, Trump's, uh, it's not like we, we don't have enough wars already that we have to create a sixth branch of, uh, of the armed forces, uh, which he's proposed to call the space force. Uh, because it, he saw something on television that uh, suggested that would be a good idea, uh, and so he's put it forward. Uh, it is a joke. Uh, it doesn't have. Uh, it's not not a sixth branch of government at all, uh, of armed forces uh, at all. But all that aside, it, it is just the, the the foot in the door that the military uh, contractors uh, want, because uh, they will then make something of it. Trump just tossed the idea out there, but they will pick it up and run with it. And we've got to confront that because they're now asking for many billions of dollars more and it will be an endless amount of money because space is infinite, right? And so, so that, that we, can, we can go fight, as Ted Cruz said, uh, space pi pirates. Uh, so I think he should be the first one to go up. But, <laughs> Okay, we had a question over here. Yeah. When, when Pete Buttigieg returned to the United States from Oxford, he joined the McKinsey corporate group, 7,700 employees, one of the most powerful and conservative uh, consulting groups in the world. He yes. spent three years there. I'm concerned that he, that's where he's getting his money and he was groomed for what he's doing now. Do you have any thoughts about Pete Buttigieg? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I think there are many, many good things can be said about him, uh, uh, and there are uh, plenty of good people uh, who support him. But you need to look, you need to follow the money, the old story, uh, because it's not just McKinsey, that's one thing, uh, but he is the Wall Street candidate in, in the Democratic Party, uh, and he's getting most of it, well, I don't know if it's most of it, but the biggest chunks of the money is coming from Wall Street, and he's spent an enormous amount of time uh, in those uh, hedge funds and uh, 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 centers of uh, money up there, uh, dragging a sack uh, and trying to load it up. And I can tell you uh, from political experience in Texas, I know that if you take the corporate check, written on the back is the corporate agenda. Uh, and you're not going to cash the check, they're going to cash the check. Mm -hmm. So that's, that is a real danger, and, and we need to get clear from him uh, what, what he's intending uh, with that money, by taking that money. One more question. Hello, friends. Um, I actually have a poem I'd like to share. I wrote this during the uh, second <laughs> Bush plague, but it still seems appropriate. I pledge a grievance to the flag of the divided state of America and to the Republic Republicans for whom we can't stand, one nation under their God, money, reprehensible, denying liberty and justice for 99% of us all. Okay. Well, all right. Thanks, everybody. We're, we're done, but let's go socialize outside. Thank you so much for coming. We'll We'll, I'll be out at the beer keg so we can visit there. Thank you.